making its report card. Ladies and gentlemen of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Please. You don't know how heartwarming that is to just come back from Iran and be greeted like that. <laughs> Bob and Elizabeth Dole, Vice President, members of the Cabinet, and honored guests, and my dear friends. First, I'd like to congratulate the new Republican leaders who will be on the point for the GOP in the upcoming 100th Congress. Republican leader Dole will again have a solid team to back him up. Alan Simpson, John Chafee, Bill Armstrong, Pat Cochran, and Rudy Barswich, and of course, our honorary president pro tem, Strom Thurmond, who will keep an eye on all of you. <laughs> we salute all of you and are proud of the qualities, the leadership that you bring uh, to the Senate, and also a heartfelt Welcome to Senators-elect Bond and McCain, new members of the Senate, but both battle-hardened political veterans. <laughs> Kit and John, we're happy to have you aboard. And it was so good to have with us tonight Howard and Joy Baker. I think they had to depart early to catch a, either a train or a plane. I didn't quite get which one it was going to be. But this is one of those occasions when it is easy, as Bob hinted, to get a little misty. We've been a team, men and women who've shared a vision and who've developed bonds of friendship while working to turn our goals for America into reality. Tonight, we honor in particular Senators Laxwell, Goldwater, and Mathias, and all those who will not be returning for the battles in the years ahead. Paul Laxalt, as is no secret, has been close to me these last six years and long before that. I'd managed to stay his friend, even if it meant having to eat those special dishes at his Basque barbecues. <clears throat> Some of you'll have to explain to others. <laughs> Paul, Nancy, and I are grateful for all you've been meant to us, and we'll miss you and Carol. <laughs> Senator Goldwater, who was not able to be with us this evening, has been our inspiration, indeed the conscience, of conservatives. And six years ago at this very dinner, I saluted Barry, saying then what remains true today. His principal stand in 1964, the ideals he expressed, the courage he displayed, captured our imaginations. He was a pathfinder, a point man, and in these last six years, his guidance and grit and wisdom have strengthened our resolve and kept us going. And then there's Senator Mathias, who also couldn't be with us this evening. Mac is the kind of individual who's made Washington a fun place to work. We worked together when he was the chairman of my second inaugural committee. And whatever the issue of the day, no matter how hotly contested, he was always a gentleman. His goodwill, thoughtfulness, and sense of humor have been appreciated. Mac and I didn't always agree, 
but I always had the deepest respect for him. He will be missed. Those of us in the class of 1980 came here six years ago dedicated to strengthening our country's economy, rebuilding our defenses and restoring our confidence. To those of you who will leave the Senate next year, we can be proud of what we've accomplished individually and collectively. Mark Andrews has stood by and fought for the farmer through difficult times. And thanks to the efforts of Jim Abner, this week I was able to sign a landmark water resources bill into law which will benefit Americans of present and future generations. Jim Broyhill has had a long and dedicated career in Congress. A keen parliamentarian, he brought leadership in the area of energy and commerce. Jerry Denton, an American hero, is a hero still. In the Senate, he fought against terrorism and held up traditional family values. Slade Gordon played a key role as a member of the Budget Committee and helped to give us a stronger America. Paula Hawkins mobilized our country against drugs and child abuse. Mac Mattingly championed the line item veto and was indispensable this year to our success in aiding the freedom fighters in Nicaragua. Each of you has my thanks and I know that of your colleagues. But more important, you have the gratitude of the nation. None of us came to Washington simply to have a job. We came here to get a job done, and that's what we did. America is a more prosperous land, a more secure land, and yes, a happier land because of what we've done. And let no one doubt the fundamental beliefs that guided our decisions, the principles which we hold so dear, have not been rejected. On the contrary, they are still unquestionably in the ascendant. Our opponents in this campaign, in so many instances, paid us the ultimate compliment. They refused to discuss issues, ceding that turf, knowing that the American people still hold allegiance to our ideas. Yet no two ways about it. The outcome of the Senate race was a disappointment. We're a minority again in the United States Senate, but we've been there before and know what must be done. As Everett Dirksen, a great Republican leader, said, we must stand up and be counted in our generation. Yes, the election results in the Senate may make our task more difficult. Many of you will be playing new roles in the struggle to direct the course of our country's future. But let us not forget, I'm going to change that around. I was raised in an era in which the employer, first major employer I had, said you should never use a negative. Let's say, let us remember that the underlying long-term message of the election was positive. Governorships were one that will redirect state government and grassroots politics throughout our country. The Senate vote itself, contrary to what our opponents have been saying, reflected a continued evolution in our direction. With a change of 29,000 votes, control of the Senate would still be in our hands. And this in the face of historical trends that work against the party in power. There's ample reason for optimism. At every rally across our country, young people in great numbers could be seen and heard. Their youthful idealism, their energy, their zest for life made those rallies joyous occasions. Especially for someone who used to cause a hostile riot just by showing up on a campus. A certain governor, I remember. I remember back in the days when, well, when I had first become a Republican, because I was in the other party, then, as the Bible says, I put aside childish things. And, uh, and I, but when I was new as a Republican and I would go and appear at a fundraiser or something for the party, and I would come home to Nancy and I would say that the only young people there looked like they couldn't be invited anywhere else. Well, that's all changed now. America's young people have responded to our message of opportunity, growth, and strength. And in all the age groups, those between 18 and 24 today have the highest percentage of any age group of people supporting 
what we represent, what we stand for. That's all changed now. They've responded to our message of opportunity, as I say, growth and strength, and they don't want to be told to lower their expectations. They don't want to give their lives over to central planners in Washington. They want the same kind of freedom that we had and the same challenge to go as far and as high as their hard work and talents will carry them. And as long as we keep faith with them, this generation of Americans will keep faith with us. What we've been doing these last six years, of course, has been for them. And when today's young people have grown a bit older, when we see them with families and children of their own, living in their own homes with productive jobs, we can all feel pride in the job that we've done in these last six years. Our young people have been spared the ravages of war and have enjoyed the same sweet liberty we possessed as young adults in the United States. Our reward is knowing that we did our best for them, for our country, and for the cause of human freedom. In a word, the challenge now before us is simply this, to complete the revolution that we have so well begun. Of course, I'll be talking about this in detail in the days to come, but you know of our commitments to the American people on the balanced budget amendment, the line item veto, you know the importance of keeping tax rates low and spending under control, and of appointing federal judges who will interpret law, not make it. And yes, you know of the freedom fighters around the world who need our help and with whom we are determined to stand. In these last six years, we have left the days of retreat and apology behind. We've again made America the engine of enterprise, the bastion of freedom, the hope for a beleaguered mankind that God intended her to be. In tackling our agenda, I want to assure you of one important thing. Now, more than ever, we'll need to depend on one another to achieve our goals for this country. No, I've never served in a legislature before, that's true. But after six years down the avenue here, I think I understand your problems pretty well. And I know that your problems are my problems too. We're one team. We've got to stick together even more effectively in the Congress to come. So in the years ahead, no matter where we are, we can be proud that we were members of the class of 1980 and that together we changed history. God bless all of you. You'll always have a place in my heart. Thank you. Propose a toast to the President of the United States, Senator Thurman. Well, this I'll be glad to do it. <laughs> President Ms. Reagan, Vice President Ms. Bush, ladies and my fellow colleagues. Just for proposing, proposing a toast to the President, I want to say to Ms. Reagan that she has made an ideal first lady. I don't know of anyone who. <clears throat> I don't know of any first lady in the past who has advocated high ideals, more lofty principles, and done more for humanity, the drug field and many other fields, and Nancy Reagan, and we are proud of you. <clears throat> and Ms. Reagan, I, I just want to say to you that we admire you for your beauty, we respect you for your intelligence, 
We adore you for your charm, and we love you because we can't help it. <laughs> Mr. President, it's indeed an honor for me just to, to raise a glass in a few minutes and toast you. I've been here for 32 years. We haven't had a better all-around president who had more vision, more courage, more character, and has done more for humanity of this country than Ronald Reagan. His qualities of sterling character, undaunted courage, great capacity, true compassion, unfailing courtesy are qualities we would all admire. We admire you as a man and a great leader. You're a wonderful asset to this country. We are proud of you. Now let's drink a toast to the greatest president since George Washington, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> 